Good morning. Let me welcome you to Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church. If we've not met, my name is Matty. I'm the minister of the church here. And we want to extend a warm welcome this morning to all, to any who are spiritually weary and seeking rest, to any who mourn and long for comfort, to any who struggle and seek victory, to all who sin and need a savior, to any who are strangers and who want fellowship, to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and whoever will come, wherever you may come from, well, this church is for you this morning, and we welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. The theme of our time together this morning is that Jesus is the giver of life. We read words in John's gospel towards the end, writing about all the things he's recorded about Jesus, and he says, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. As we gather together this morning then, we come not just to learn moral lessons, not just to enjoy a company with one another, but to know the life that God himself brings through the Lord Jesus. As we look at the world all around us, we see that creation itself testifies to the life that God brings in Christ. So it's right that we stand to sing our praise to God, and we'll do that by singing our first song, Creation Sings the Father's Song. So as we're led, if we're able, I'll invite you to stand and we'll sing together to God's praise. <laughs> seated and let's join together in prayer 
Father God, we thank you for the wonderful truths that we've just been singing, that you are the king of creation, that it is right that we bring you our praise, that we sing our hallelujahs, that we praise you for the wonderful things that you have done. This morning, we thank you that the beautiful creation all around us that we can enjoy and wonder at together is a mere taste of the true wonder that comes in the life that you give in and through the Lord Jesus. That we pray that you would strengthen us this morning in that life. That we pray that many around us in our communities would come to know the life that he brings for themselves. We pray that in the many broken and hurting parts of our world, you would bring that life to light. We pray that among us, you would be strengthening those who mourn, comforting those who are brought low, encouraging those who are struggling in many ways, and strengthening those who seek to walk with you in faithfulness in the life that Christ brings. We ask all these things in and through the name of Jesus. And we join all of our prayers together by praying the words that Jesus himself taught us in the Lord's Prayer, which will appear on the screen. We pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're now going to have our Bible reading this morning, and Anne Craig is going to come and read Mark chapter 2, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 6. And you can find that in the Church Bibles on page 837. So Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to chapter 3, verse 6. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed and sore the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the cornfields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck ears of corn. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, it is lawful on the Sabbath to do good. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked round at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Amen. May God bless his word. 
Thank you, Anne, for reading God's word for us. I'm just going to pray now for our young ones before they head out to their Sunday groups, and then we'll say our goodbyes to them. Father God, we thank you for our children and young people. We pray that as they head through now for Sunday groups, you would be at work among young hearts and minds to draw them into the life that Jesus brings and walking with him. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll say goodbye to the Sunday school folks now. Choosing interesting routes to get out this morning, that's okay. Uh, just as the young ones head out, we're going to just take a brief pause to consider some church family notices. Uh, first of all, a reminder that Edna Holland's funeral is coming up this Wednesday at 12 noon here in church, and then refreshments at the National Hotel over the road just after that. Then uh, coming up also this Wednesday is the first of our six, seven-week spring series um, you'll see on the screen that we have a plan uh, for uh, these sessions. I think it's the next slide along. There we go. Uh, this is an outline of where we'll be going over the next six weeks, and then there'll be an extra session beyond that too. The nature of these uh, seminars being quite interactive, being quite discussion-based, is that they don't lend themselves to being live-streamed. Uh, so I'd like to encourage you all, if you possibly can, uh, come and join us in the hall uh, for these sessions. Uh, and if you need a lift, uh, a reminder that in the most recent newsletter that went out, there is a link you can click where you can request or offer a lift if that, if that will help you get here. Uh, the prayer focus evenings, they will be live streamed. They're a bit more straightforward content from the front and then prayer. So we can live stream those. But I'd like to encourage you, if you can, please join us for this spring series. It's a really good opportunity for us to join together and consider what it means to be a church and to be a church family to one another. And you'll also see there on the screen that on the 24th of April, so that's two weeks on Wednesday, uh, the AGM will take place during our spring series session that night. There'll be a shorter teaching session, and then we'll have our AGM that night. So please do come and join us if you're able. Then next, we've got a bit ahead of ourselves there, but uh, in a big country, the Rural Ministry Conference is taking place in our church on the 20th of April. We're not running that, but we are hosting it and a really good opportunity to get some a good teaching on what it means to be a church in a rural context and how we can serve and glorify God uh, where we are. So it would be a wonderful thing if uh, a few of us wanted to come along to that. You can sign up on the Free Church website. Uh, then finally, I've been asked to announce that uh, the Women for Mission groups in Maryborough and Muir of Ord are holding a coffee morning on the 27th of April in Maryborough Church Hall. That will take place from 10 to 12 on the 27th of April, so last Saturday of the month, and there's a chance to purchase, I'm told, delicious cakes and produce, as well as household items, and any donations will be welcome. So if you want to go along. I've sampled some of the baking in Maryborough Church recently. I can commend it to you, uh, worth uh, paying for. I can't speak to Muir of Ord. I'm sure it's just as good, but please get along there on the 27th of April and support that uh, Women for Mission project. Well, that's all from me for now, by way of notices. Uh, in a short while, we'll turn back to Mark's gospel, and I'll preach on the passage that Anne read for us. But before then, we're going to stand and sing once more from God's word, this time from Psalm 32. Uh, Jesus brings life. He does it by forgiving our sins, and that is a true and wonderful blessing. So we sing together, sins forgiven. What a blessing, what a joy to hear this word. Let's stand for evil and sing to God's praise. Sins, <coughs> sins forgiven, what a blessing, what a
to reach for your Bibles and turn back to page 837 and to Mark chapter 2. And as we make our way there to page 837, let me lead us in prayer as we ask for God's help to understand his word. Father God, we thank you once again that in Jesus we have life. And so we pray that as we read your word together this morning, that you would help us to have life in his name as we read and understand more of who he is and what he's done. We pray it in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen. Within about 30 seconds of meeting someone, even if you don't want to do this, within about 30 seconds, you're going to either ask or be asked two questions. Who are you? What do you do? Maybe, what's your name? What's your job? But some variation on those two questions. I find that even when I go in, determined to not ask the same old questions, sooner or later, we come back to it. Who are you? What do you do? If anyone has got any more creative suggestions for how they introduce themselves to people, I'd be glad to hear them. But each week, as we return to Mark's gospel in these Sunday mornings, we find that these are the questions that Mark is concerned with in his account of the life of Jesus. As Mark seeks to introduce Jesus to his reader, he's answering two questions time and again. Who is Jesus and why did he come? Who are you? What do you do? Who is Jesus? Why did he come? And as we get more familiar with Jesus... As Mark gradually reveals more and more about his identity and his purpose, well, we find that this week and next, we are being shown that Jesus is God's King who is doing a new work and gathering a new people. And as well as that, that knowing this King means joy and life instead of the joyless following of endless rules. So that's what we want to see this morning, that Jesus is a king doing a new thing, and that new thing brings life and joy and not lifeless rule-keeping. So two headings to consider in our time together this morning. First is this, knowing Jesus means feasting, not fasting. Now, there's a bit of important background to the question Jesus gets asked here. Uh, We read it there in verse 18. Uh, Why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Fasting is something which the Old Testament law required, but only required once a year. Now, it wasn't uncommon for it to be practiced more frequently sometimes as a show of contrition, sometimes as a show of spiritual dependence upon God, but it isn't explicitly commanded that it must be followed and kept more regularly. And in fact, there are some places in the Old Testament where God specifically says that extra fasting will not win his people extra favor with himself. So I take it from the fact that we read here two groups of people are in the habit of fasting. We read that John's disciples, John the Baptist, we met him a couple of chapters ago, and the Pharisees, we met them too, these teachers of the law, these gatekeepers of the old way of doing things. These two distinct groups are fasting. So I think we should take it that by Jesus' day, it wasn't uncommon for fasting to be a regular practice. And also the fact that John's disciples are doing it means that it could be a healthy and well-intentioned spiritual exercise by which people express their dependence on God. But if the Pharisees are doing it, well, it could also be a self-righteous extra display of piety. And it does seem that there's plenty of that going on. The Pharisees seem to have been taking this a lot further than they needed to. 
I've mentioned before that the Pharisees, what they did was they tended to take the Old Testament laws and then they added pages and pages of their own rules on top of them and insisted that everyone followed their rules, not just what was actually in the Bible. And fasting seems to have been one of these things. The Pharisees, they were not content to just get on and do it by themselves. They had to insist that everyone else did their thing too. And elsewhere we learn that actually, for them, it wasn't this private, intimate expression of their dependence on God. Elsewhere, Jesus himself chastises the Pharisees because when they fast, they walk around intentionally looking miserable, looking hungry, telling everyone how miserable they are for God's glory and insisting that everyone sees how brilliant, how spiritual they must be if they're willing to be so hungry. I remember back when I was a student, I don't know if it's still a thing, but back then, late 2000s, early 2010s, it was quite in vogue for students to fast. Uh, we all did it in our Christian union. If we had like, a big thing, let's all fast together so that we can pray and focus on that. And as you can imagine, it soon became a competition of who was fasting the most and who was the most miserable about it. And I was pretty miserable, as you can imagine, not eating for 24 hours. And I told everyone what I was doing. I remember going to the canteen in my halls and lining up for dinner and not getting anything, just like I said to people, well, I'm fasting actually, because I'm trying to win God's favor and pray by fasting. That's kind of like what the Pharisees were doing, but even more so. Fasting is fine. Fasting is a good thing when we do it between us and God. But when we turn it into a rule, and when we turn it into something which is all about how holy and amazing I look, we've gone wrong. That's what the Pharisees were doing. And so Jesus' response, it doesn't just answer the, the question he's presented with. As he often does, Jesus takes a question, and in answering it, he also reveals his identity and his purpose. So Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? Well, answer one, because Jesus is the bridegroom. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. I don't know the last time you went to a wedding. I've been to quite a few in my time. And what tends to happen is that after the vows have been exchanged, the rings have been placed on the right fingers, the minister will say, I now pronounce you husband and wife, and you can now kiss the bride. And as husband and wife lean in for a little smooch, everyone claps and cheers and goes woohoo, and everyone celebrates. It would be weird, wouldn't it? If at that moment in the service, instead of clapping and cheering and whooping and a, a day of feasting and celebration, it would be weird if the minister said, I now pronounce you man and wife, you can now kiss your bride, and everyone stood up and wept and put on funeral clothes and walked out of the church looking quite miserable. Uh, I'm sure that there may be some brides who may be thinking that when they realize the man they've married, and I can't think of anyone specifically, but generally... A wedding's a happy day. It would be inappropriate to treat a wedding like a funeral because a wedding is a time of celebration. And it was a happy day of celebration in Jesus' time as well. But unlike today when, for some reason, all the focus is on the bride, in Jesus' day, the bridegroom was the main player. Uh, the groom's job today is basically to get dressed and turn up, and if he manages a half-decent wins or not on a couple of good gags in a speech, it's job done. But in the first century, the bridegroom was a lot more than that. This was master of ceremonies, wedding planner, caterer, and host all rolled into one. It was actually a very important function of the bridegroom to ensure that all of his guests were having a really good time well-fed, well-watered, and joining in the celebration. It would be a cause of great shame and embarrassment for the bridegroom if that wasn't the case. The party quite literally did not start until the bridegroom arrived. There was usually fasting and sobriety before he came and then celebrating when he arrived. 
So Jesus is using this analogy as something they would all be familiar with at the time. Why are your disciples fasting? Well, you might as well ask why we would fast at a wedding. It's a happy time. It's a time of celebration. It's not the right time to fast. I wonder if already there's something quite remarkable then in Jesus' self-identification here. Why do your disciples fast and look miserable? Well, because they shouldn't. Because my disciples should know joy and celebration. There's a challenging question for us to reflect on. Is that always the message that we imbibe to the world? Those of us who do know Jesus, if people looked at us, would they say, well, here is someone who knows joy and celebration? Or would they see us as, as people who know misery and monotony? I know that far too often I'm guilty of the latter and not good enough at showing the former. I wonder too, though, if you're coming to church as someone who's just investigating things, is that a surprise to you? Do you expect to find a Jesus who says, following me is a life of being boring and mundane and vanilla? Well, if so, he's saying that's not the case. He's saying that knowing me means it's appropriate to celebrate and to have joy. But of course, all this goes a lot deeper. Jesus is not just He's not big-headed. He's not saying, well, I'm just far too much fun for anyone to fast around me. There's something so much more fundamental to Jesus' identity being revealed. You see, throughout the Old Testament, the image of the bridegroom is a really striking one. There are a few passages where God looking forward to the day when he will send his chosen king to save and restore his people, God describes himself as the husband or the bridegroom of his people. So that there are lots of these passages, but just as one example, Isaiah 62 should appear on the screen. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married." For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Bridegroom, then, is actually a huge statement that Jesus is making about his own identity. Jesus is saying that the time has come when God has acted to save his people from their sins and to restore them to knowing him and worshiping him. Jesus is saying, that's who I am. That's why I have come. I am the one who was promised, the bridegroom who has come to do this. It also makes sense of what he says about the bridegroom going away, that he will have to leave his disciples, he will go to the cross, he will taste even death itself to pay the price for sin and to secure the feasting and joy that come from being forgiven, being restored to right relationship with our God. It makes sense of what he says next too. It's not just his identity being revealed, it's his purpose. This stuff in verses 21 and 22 about uh, garments and wineskins, we don't have time to dive into every single detail, but suffice to say, both of these are images of how Jesus, he hasn't come to just try and fit in with the current order. He hasn't come to just try and get on board with the old Israel and maybe make a couple of tweaks here and there. Jesus saying, I have come to do something completely and totally new. Jesus has come to bring about the once and for all forgiveness of sins for all who trust in him. And therefore to allow all who do know and trust him to know a life of joy and celebration. We sang earlier, sins forgiven, what a blessing, what a joy to hear that word. Words from Psalm 32, and we're being reminded of that here. It is a truly amazing, a truly wonderful thing that God has made a way for us ruined, needy, broken sinners to be forgiven, to be restored, 
to be able to call him Father. It is cause for joy, it is cause for celebration that Jesus has come. And so I suppose the natural question for us is, I wonder how much we are experiencing that joy this morning. Or maybe to ask it a different way, is your experience of the Christian life more like a wedding or a funeral? Is your experience of the Christian life one where you regularly feel the need to rejoice and to celebrate or one where you feel perpetually guilty and downtrodden and as if you're constantly feeling God. Guys, it's right that our sin should grieve us, it should cause us to sorrow, and that should rightly lead us to repentance, of course. But it is also right that we feel the relief and feel the joy that comes from knowing Jesus, knowing the one who has decisively dealt with our sin, who has nailed it to the cross, who has removed it from us as far as east is from the west. So for the week ahead then, for those of us who are tempted towards despair and self-flagellation and constantly telling ourselves that we're not good enough for God and we're letting him down and ourselves down and our church down, in those moments, here's something to remind ourselves of. Jesus the bridegroom has come. My sins have been forgiven and so now joy is mine. The bridegroom is coming back one day. And when he does, he will bring me into the ultimate and eternal wedding banquet where sin will never trouble me again. And so joy is mine now. I will know that joy fully and in abundance on that day, but I can know it in a real way even now. Knowing Jesus means feasting, not fasting. Knowing Jesus means knowing the joy of sins really and actually forgiven. And we can all walk in that joy if we know and follow him. Knowing Jesus. Feasting, not fasting. Similarly, secondly, knowing Jesus means life and not loss. And we see in chapter 2, verse 23, to 3, verse 6, another area where the Pharisees have gone further than Scripture goes. Here, it's their observance of the Sabbath. Now, time doesn't allow us to focus in too much detail on what the Sabbath is. Uh, I would commend to you, uh, is a big-headed to commend this? I don't know, I preached a sermon on the Sabbath recently in our Ten Commandments series. That's a longer treatment of that topic, so you could give that a listen if you want a deeper dive on that, or just Google a good preacher and listen to their sermons on the Sabbath instead. But the main point is that consistently in the Old Testament... The Sabbath is a gracious and good gift from God, something which is for the benefit of all of his creation. Clearly, that is something the Pharisees have lost sight of, hence why they make such a big deal about Jesus picking corn with his disciples. Similarly, this question of healing, they've become so tied to following these really strict rules that they've completely forgotten the heart of the God who lies behind the Sabbath. What they have done is they have turned a wonderful and gracious gift into a burdensome chore. And Jesus masterfully exposes their hypocrisy in both cases. Answer one, the first time he's accused of breaking the Sabbath. Well, he says there's precedent within the Scriptures to show that the spirit of the Sabbath is a lot more generous than the letter. After all, if even King David can eat consecrated bread on the Sabbath, it's entirely appropriate and right for Jesus and his disciples to pick some corn. Jesus' message is summed up in verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's a really helpful and succinct way of summing up where they're going wrong, forgetting or maybe even willfully overlooking the gracious character of God himself, 
reflected in the Sabbath. It is a gift to be enjoyed, something which is for man, not a burdensome list of rules to follow, something which man is made for. But the second response Jesus gives to this question is actually a lot more serious and it completely turns the tables on his accusers. Interestingly, if you read through all of Mark chapter 2 and then into this first part of chapter 3, we notice that opposition to the Pharisees is gathering pace. We first noticed this a couple of weeks ago. I said that opposition enters the scene when we, we meet the Pharisees the first time. But we see a, a build-up if we go through it. At first, we're told that when they meet Jesus, they think to themselves that he's a blasphemer. Then, chapter 2, verse 16, they go and question Jesus' disciples. Chapter 2, verse 24, here, they question Jesus himself. And then chapter 3 and verse 2, they're actively trying to look for reasons to accuse Jesus. So we get this movement, this ramping up from internal to external and obvious opposition. It's almost as if they think Jesus is on trial here. They think that they are judge, jury, and executioner, and it's their right to look at Jesus and to find reasons to accuse him and to find reasons to have him punished. What Jesus does in chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, is show that actually, he's not on trial. They are. Chapter 3, verse 3, he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked round at them in anger, grieved at the hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. This question cuts right to the heart of the issue. It's such an obvious one. Yes, of course, it is lawful to rest from works on the Sabbath, but there's a higher law at play. If the Sabbath is a good God's good gift, then of course it is lawful to do good and to save lives and livelihoods on the Sabbath. And so here their silence speaks volumes. Their complete failure to answer what is such an easy and obvious question shows that these people don't really know God at all. They're silent because they don't want to expose their own lack of compassion, their own lack of interest in really honoring God to the people around them. They don't want it shown so clearly how much more interested they are in preserving their own traditions than in actually doing good and honoring God and loving his people. Friends, I feel like when we meet the Pharisees, we always need to clarify that we are not the Pharisees. If we are here this morning as people who know and trust Jesus, there is a fundamental difference between us and them. I quite love Jesus. They hate him and want to kill him. That's a fundamental difference. But even with that said, sometimes they serve as a rebuke to us. And so as we look at this story and we reflect on it, and we realize that we sometimes find ourselves more interested in forcing people to do things our way or to follow our rules and traditions, good as they may be, though they're not actually in the Bible and they're not demanded of us in the Bible, if we find ourselves doing that, well, we've gone a bit wrong. Anytime we lay a burden on somebody else that Scripture itself doesn't lay, we've gone slightly further towards being Pharisees than we'd like. But as I say, we are different because Jesus doesn't just expose the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Jesus actually goes on to pronounce judgment on them. And we'll see next week that one thing Jesus has come to do is to gather to himself a new people, come to completely supplant this old order, these old gatekeepers of the old way of doing things. Jesus has come to gather a new people, his people, God's people by faith and not by following traditions. 
Here we see the beginnings of that. This judgment that Jesus is pronouncing on them. This revelation that their way is dying out. We see it in how they provoke Jesus' righteous anger. Their hardness of heart. Their distance from God. Their failure to rightly shepherd and care for his people is laid bare before them. I know that there's some among us, even this morning, who have got one eye on the sermon and one eye on the croft and the the idea that lambs may need to be tended to. That's what good shepherds do. They care for their sheep. They show them love. They show them care and dedication. If the Pharisees were meant to be under shepherds of God's people, well, they were failing. Not showing them care, just forcing burdens on them. Throughout this whole episode, Jesus' identity is once again made clearer. Verse 28, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Just like with the bridegroom, Jesus is taking an Old Testament term and applying it to himself. So what we have here is actually a really explicit claim of Jesus to be God and to have God's authority. Because in the Old Testament, the Son of Man is a figure sent from God himself with God's power and God's authority to accomplish God's work. And once again, here we have Jesus saying, remember, that's who I am. The fact that he is Lord of the Sabbath is showing us that he is the one who perfectly fulfills and teaches God's law with complete authority. Now, of course, Jesus calls his followers into a life of obedience. It is good and right that we want to follow God's commands. But here we have a reminder that just trying to follow rules is not the key to life. Knowing Jesus is the key to life. Find it interesting, there are two possible responses to realizing that in this passage. One explicit, one implicit. The first one, seeing Jesus claiming to be the Son of Man, seeing Jesus to be claiming to be the one who brings life, reaction number one, murderous hatred. That's the Pharisees. 3 verse 6, they went out and immediately held counsel with Herodians how to destroy him. They're so enraged by Jesus' refusal to get with the program, by his presumption to teach God's laws with greater authority than them, that they want him dead. It's an extreme reaction. And yet even today, there are some who find the idea of God's grace so objectionable that actually they hate it. This wonderful gospel that we know and love, that we think is so liberating and life-giving, some people really kick against it. Some people think that if actually I can't contribute to it, I can't earn it myself, well, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm a self-made man. How could I believe in a God? How could I love a God who gives me no special standing based on my own merits and who calls other people who I don't think are as good as me to be part of his kingdom too? Some people really, really hate the idea of grace. And sometimes, just sometimes, we might find that kind of thinking seeping in to our own hearts too. Yes, we're all saved by grace, but surely I'm a little bit better than that person over there. Now, we need to resist that way of thinking. We need to not despise Jesus for the life that he alone can bring. You can't work your way up to God, but wonderfully, you don't have to. And as we've seen, knowing Jesus and knowing freedom from always having to strive to impress is actually a really liberating and joy-filled and life-giving thing. So no murderous hatred. Second response is implicit and all through Mark's gospel, faith and belief. If knowing Jesus brings life, not loss, well, if you haven't already done so, please let me urge you to come to him in faith, knowing the life, knowing the joy that he brings. And for those of us who have, well, let me urge you, keep clinging to Jesus in faith. I know that the life that he brings is yours, is ours, because of who he is, not because of who we are or what we've done. 
So if we find that we have messed up this week and we feel this morning that we are far from God, or if we find ourselves anxious in the Christian life because we're never doing quite a good enough job, or even on the flip side, if we feel smug and proud in the Christian life, thinking I'm doing a pretty good job at following God all by myself, well, remember that Jesus and only Jesus brings life. So absolutely, let's strive to obey him. He is our Lord. But let's also never lose the wonder that he gives us life by his grace. Not fasting, but feasting. Not laws and legalism, but joy and life itself. Amen. And it's right that we respond to God's word by singing our praises to him. And we're going to do that by singing words from Psalm 19, which attests to the life-giving, joy-giving nature of God's Word. So before we come to share in the Lord's Supper, let's stand once again to sing our praises to God from Psalm 19. to the Lord's Supper, and it's right as we do that we fix our gaze on the Lord, and we have this visual and physical reminder in front of us of the joy, the feasting, the life, and celebration that Jesus brings to all who know and trust in Him in faith. The Lord's Supper is a wonderful gift. It is a gift of God for any who believe that we are entirely dependent on Jesus' humble and self-giving sacrifice. Because as we eat and drink, what we're doing is once again expressing our complete dependence on Him as the only one who can forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So sharing in the supper, it is an act of faith. It is a statement that we believe in and want to receive and benefit from the salvation that Jesus won for us on the cross. As we receive, we're not only remembering Jesus' death, but we're asking him to feed and strengthen us to live wholeheartedly for him. And we're looking forward to the day when we will go to be with him and join in the true and everlasting feast of the bridegroom as we dine with Jesus in his perfect new creation. With all that said, then, the invitation to the Lord's table, it's not just for members of our church. It is not just for super Christians or for people who feel like they are worthy. It is for anyone who knows Jesus and is trusting personally in him for their salvation. Now, if that doesn't currently describe you, it would be better that you did not receive the bread and the wine this morning. And I would encourage you instead to use this time to reflect more 
about your own response to the Lord Jesus? That would you want to come and cling to him in faith as we were hearing? Would you know the life and the joy that he brings? Please use this time to reflect on that. And I'd love to speak to you afterwards if that's the case. Uh, very practically, the bread and the wine will be brought to you by our elders and deacons. When you receive the elements, please hang on to them till everyone has been served. And then when that time comes and we all have a, a cup of wine and a piece of bread, I'll say a few more words and then we'll eat and then drink all together to express the fact that though we are many, we are also one body because we all share in one bread and drink one wine. Uh, on that as well, practically, as the wine is brought round, the middle ring on these trays is non-alcoholic, so if you need to avail yourself of that, please do. It's highlighted in green there on the screen. But before we receive, we are going to acknowledge again in prayer that all of our confidence lies not in ourselves to get ourselves to heaven, but in Jesus himself. And so we'll join in one voice to confess our sins before God. This prayer of confession that's appeared on the screen just take a moment to read over it, reflect on these words, see if you can make them your own, and then after a brief pause, I'll lead us as we say it together. So we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repentant. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me read words to us from God's word, 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning, not trusting in our own goodness and righteousness, but only in your mercy and grace poured out for us through the sacrifice of your Son. And so we thank you for this bread and this wine and juice, these good gifts before us of your creation. We thank you that they are for us a vivid reminder of the suffering and death that your son was willing to endure for us and for our salvation. We pray in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll invite the elders and deacons to come now and to serve the bread and the wine.
take and eat this, remembering that Christ died for you and feeding on him in your heart by faith and full of thanksgiving. Christ's blood was shed for you. So drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's pray together again. Father God, we thank you for feeding us spiritually through the Lord Jesus. We praise you for his sacrifice, how his body was broken, how his blood was shed for the forgiveness of all who put their trust in him. We thank you for the assurance of our sins forgiven as we trust in Jesus and pray that you would strengthen us to live for him until the day he returns. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We can enjoy this gift of God through faith because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross where he finished his great work of redemption. So to God's praise, we'll stand and sing our final song, It Was Finished Upon That Cross. Let me invite you to stand and sing if you're able. to the King of ages, immortable, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>